Some would say, uh, are you going to reintroduce Ralph? Didn't you do that on Sunday? No, well, I did. And I'll do it again today, and I'll do it again next Sunday, and I'll do it again and again and again and again. As many opportunities as the Lord allows me to do so. Um, you all know him, and uh, you all are coming to love him, and I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's a real blessing to have Ralph bring us the word again tonight. Ralph, bring us the word. Y'all have your armor on? I'm in Texas, so I can use y'all. <laughs> now, this is true. When we came in 1982 to Austin Bible Church in the old building, they had a service of sorts. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but I was naturalized as a Texan since I'm a Kansas farm boy. <laughs> They said that would make it a little easier for me to minister to Texans, per se. <laughs> I want you to turn to John chapter 1, verses 14 and 18. John chapter 1, verses 14 and 18. The subject is paterology. <laughs> One of the old-time people said, you know, what do you got there, Ralph? I thought there was Christology and I knew there was pneumatology. What's this uh, paterology all about? Ah. This is burning in my soul and I have to say that without any elitism or showing off. This is angelic conflict territory. People say, why haven't you written your book yet? Well, I didn't have the maturity. I mean that. We're dealing with maturity when we talk about the Father's agape when we're talking about Irene, his peace. You see, when you start with a divine outline out of the Bible, I just take three L's, eternal life. All right? Absolute light in which there's no darkness at all. Perfect love, the three L's. Life, light, and love. That's the divine outline of the Word of God. Now, people ask a lot about relationships and how relationships, as far as families are concerned, are put together. That's paterology. That's relationships. The relationship of God the Father to His Son. The relationship of Abraham to Isaac in Genesis 22, where love is first mentioned in the Word of God. It's an interesting study when you get into these things. But I have to say that there's a real difficulty in communication when I get to that. Let me illustrate. A man claimed to have a large dog that could talk. Let's name him Titan. The idea was to go in a cafe and tell the owner that if the dog Titan could talk, then the owner could get a free meal and maybe the dog could too. Well, the cafe, uh, uh, cafe uh, the restaurant cafe owner said, well, yeah, yeah, if he could, you know. So his owner said, what's sandpaper like? And the dog went, woof. He said, that's the way a dog barks. That, that's, that's not the way it is. The guy said, well, you give me another chance. And after some talk, he said, okay. What's on top of a building? Woof. The guy said, you're a fake. He said, that's the way dogs sound. The guy said, man, I'm hungry. Would you give me another chance? Well, yeah, but if he doesn't come through on this one, you get kicked out. Who is the greatest baseball player of all time? Woof! He kicked him out. And down went the dog. Dog looked up and said, DiMaggio? <laughs> the difficulty of communication. And when I get in this subject that I've studied now over 35 years, I have to say that there is a real need for the work of God the Father in the life of the believer. The work of God the Father in the life of the believer. I have a very large library, I suppose. I think it's large, probably 8,000 volumes. That's not all Christian things. That includes Louis L'Amour and Zane Gray and a few other people like that. 
But when it comes right down to it, what is this? When I study this whole concept of paterology, pater for father, and logos for the word of the Father, it's very interesting. I could have a thousand volumes on Jesus Christ very easily, or I could have a thousand volumes on the Holy Spirit. I have searched the world over, and of course I'm finite, so I haven't done very much. I only have 15 books. One of the men that was in training some years ago called me on the phone and he said, I have the last book written in America on paterology. And I said to him, dear friend, can I have it? And he said, yes, I was going to give it to you anyway. And its date is 1859. The interesting thing that if you read German, and I know people who read German, so that's where I got it. I know some German, but not very much. I can't exaggerate on that, Dorothy. <laughs> she says, watch out in your German. <laughs> that they had a tremendous amount of information on paterology and it morphed into the liberalism of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men and became a socialistic thing. But from a 1710 to about 1840, 1850, there was tremendous amount of information on God the Father. If you've watched lately, most of the time today that Jesus is doing everything, in the contemporary music scene, it's all about Jesus. If you get to your hymn books and you start to get your hymn books together, and we've done that, about 1900, the Father begins to fade out of the hymn books. When I began to study paterology, I got some interesting books like Lehman Strauss, The Forgotten Father. I got some other books, The Great and Wonderful Thing. Why he put thing there, I don't know. And people began to ask me, well, what's the best book that you found on paterology, on the study of the work of God the Father? I said, the Pentecostal minister. I said, what? Yes, he starts out his book and he said, all we used to have is the Holy Spirit. So he said, we're Unitarian. And then he decided that uh, probably we were neglecting Christ. And he said, so we added Christ once in a while. But he says, Pentecostal will never teach the true word of God unless they get the Father in the Trinity. And then he goes on and says, why? And it's a marvelous book. It's very hard to find. But it's a marvelous book by the grace of God. Now, dear folks, when I look at the definitive systematic theology that we studied in Dallas, I first visited Dallas in 1953. I don't know whether you realize it, but in those days, Dallas Seminary was a Schofield Memorial Church seminary. It really was. And then in 56, we went there and graduated in 1960, so this is the 50th year. In fact, Robbie Dean has asked me, at one of the conferences sometime if I can get there to talk about the old Dallas. The old Dallas was an interesting place. Semester hour in 1956 cost four dollars. Now it's over 300. <laughs> I can prove that because I have the book <laughs> that tells us that. But when I read the theology I thought it was interesting because most of us are indebted to Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer for founding Dallas in 1924 and also for off, uh, authorizing the great systematic theology. In volume 1, page 129, he states, the term theology proper is a somewhat modern designation which represents the logical starting point in the study of systematic theology being as it is, its existence, uh, persons, characteristics, and so on of the triune God which would be Father, Son, and Spirit and of quite a part from their works. Did you get that? All right. In other words, the study in theology proper of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and quite apart from their works. That would be the works of the Father, the works of Christ, the works of the Holy Spirit, wouldn't it? 
I mean, it's very clear. Since the whole field of systematic theology is so extensive, it is the part of wisdom to reserve the consideration of the works of the triune God as unfolded in angiology, anthropology, soteriology, ecclesiology, and eschatology for further contemplation. Now notice very, very carefully the following statement. Quoting again, unabridged investigation of the truth concerning the second and third persons, including their works, is to be undertaken under the two cardinal divisions, Christology, Christology and pneumatology. Now what question comes to mind? The question comes to mind, what about the first person of the triune God, God the Father, who could be studied under the term paterology. No criticism of Dr. Chafer, I couldn't tie his shoelaces, okay? And I mean that. But isn't the study of the work of God the Father and the life of the believer important to the whole counsel of God's Word? You, the serious student of the Word of God, can answer that individually as you pursue the information given in this paper. Now, if I would give a test to a group of believers who've been under the teaching of the Word for years, and I would say, write all you can about God the Son. They would write, and they would write, and they would write. And this has been done. Have them write all they know about the Holy Spirit, and they will write, and they will write. The sealing of the Holy Spirit, the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit, all of that. Ask them to write about the work of God the Father. It'll be one sentence, two sentences, three sentences. I think if you look in Chafer's theology, maybe there's three pages on the work of the Father, maybe there's seven. It depends on how you shift that through. 